Live from Madrid, Spain, it's theCUBE. Covering HPE Discover Madrid 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Welcome back to Madrid, Spain, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We're here covering HPE Discover 2017. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host for the week, Peter Burris. Randy Meyer is back. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Synergy and Mission Critical Solutions at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And Paul Schellert is here, the Director of the Center for Theoretical Cosmology at Cambridge University. Thank you very much for coming okay. on theCUBE. It's a pleasure. Good to see you again, <laughs> Yeah, Randy. good to be back for the second time this week. I think that's a, you know, nice day out, let's play two, right? <laughs> Talking about the computing meets the cosmos. Well, it's exciting. <laughs> Yesterday we talked about Superdome Flex that we announced, we talked about it in a commercial space where it's taking HANA and Oracle databases to the next level. But there's a whole different side to what you can do with in-memory compute and it's all in this high performance computing space. You think about the problems people want to solve in fluid dynamics, in forecasting, in all sorts of analytics problems. High performance compute, one of the things it does is it generates massive amounts of data that people then want to do things with. They want to compare that data to what their model said. Okay, can I run that against? They want to take that data and visualize it, right? Okay, how do I go do that? And the more you can do that in memory, it means it's just faster to deal with because you're not going and writing this stuff off the disk, you're not moving it to another cluster back and forth. So we're seeing this burgeoning, the HPC guys would call it fat nodes, right? Where you want to put lots of memory and eliminate the I.O. to go make their jobs easier. And uh, Professor Shillard will talk about a lot of that in terms of what they're doing at the, the Cosmos Institute. But this is a trend, you don't have to be a university. We're seeing this inside of oil and gas companies, aerospace engineering companies, anybody that's solving these kind of complex computational problems that have an analytical element to whether it's compared to the model, visualize, do something with that once you've done that. Okay, so Paul, explain more about what it is you do. Well, in the Cosmos group of which I'm the head, uh, we're interested in two things. Cosmology, which is looking, uh, trying to understand where the universe comes from, the hot big bang, and then we're interested in black holes, and uh, particularly their collisions, which produce gravitational waves. So they're the two main areas, relativity and cosmology. So, oh, it's, mm. uh, it's a big topic. So, okay. uh, I mean, I don't even know where to start. I just want to know, okay, w what have you learned? <laughs> and can you summarize it for a, a lay person? I mean, where are you today? What can you share with us that, that we can understand? Well, what, what we do is we, we take our mathematical models mm -hmm. right, and we make predictions about the real universe. And so we, we try and compare those to the latest observational data. And we're in a particularly exciting period of time at the moment because of all a flood of new data about the universe and, and about black holes. And in the last two years, gravitational waves were discovered. Okay, so there's no Nobel pro, pro Nobel Prize this year, right. and so lots of things are happening. So it's a very data-driven science, and so we have to try and keep up with, with, with this flood of new data, which is getting larger and larger, and also with new types of data, because suddenly gravitational waves are the latest thing to look at. And where does the, what are the sources of, of data and new sources of data that you're tapping? Well, well, in cosmology, we're mainly interested in the cosmic microwave background. Yeah, the sources of data are the cosmos. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so this is relic radiation left over from the Big Bang fireball. Okay, so it's like a photograph of the universe, a blueprint, and, uh, and then also in the distribution of galaxies, you know, so 3D maps of the universe. And we, we've, we've, we've only, we're kind of in a new age of exploration. We've only got a tiny fraction of the universe mapped so far. And we're trying to extract new information about the origin of the universe from, from that data. In relativity, we've got these gravitational waves. You know, these are uh, ripples in space-time. They're, they're um, traversing across the universe. They're essentially earthquakes in, in the universe. And they're sound waves or seismic waves that propagate to us from these very violent events. So, so, so I want to take you to the gravitational waves because in many respects it's, it, it is an example of a lot of what's here in action. Here's what I mean. That the experiment, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically you create a, have a laser, 
two lasers perpendicular right, to each right, other, yeah, yeah, yeah. shooting a signal yeah, about two yeah. or three miles in that direction. That's right. And it is the most precise experiment ever undertaken because what you're doing is you're measuring the time it takes for one laser yeah. versus another laser, and that time is a function of the slight stretching that comes from the gravitational rays. Yeah, so yeah. that is an unbelievable example of edge computing. It, it, where you have just yeah. the tolerances to do that cannot, is that's not something you can send back to the cloud. You got to do a lot of the compute right there, right? That's right, that's right, yeah. So, so a gravitational wave comes by and you shrink one way and you stretch the it other. It distorts you know, the space time. So yeah, you become thinner. Of the wave, right. And yeah, and, and, and these tiny, tiny changes are what's measured. And, and nobody expected gravitational waves to be discovered in 2015. We, we all thought, ah, oh, another five years, another five years, you know. They've always been saying, we'll, we'll discover them, we'll discover them, uh, but it happened. And since then, it's been used two or three times to discover new types of things, uh, and there's now a whole, and I'm sure this is very central to what you're doing, there's now a whole concept of gravitational information can right. in fact become an entirely new branch of cosmology. It, have I got it, that right? Yeah, you, you, you have. It's, it's called multi-messenger astronomy now because you don't just see the universe in electromagnetic waves in light, you, you hear the universe. This is qualitatively different. It's sound waves coming across the universe. And so combining these two, the latest event was where they, they heard, the, heard the event first, then they turned their telescope and they saw it, right? And, and so much information came out of that. E even information about cosmology. Because this, these signals are traveling hundreds of billions of light years across to us, we're getting a picture of the whole universe uh, as they prop propagate all that way. So we're able to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And, and, and the techniques for the observational, the technology for observation, yeah. what, it, what is that? How has that evolved? Well, you've got the wrong guy here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, the <laughs> I'm from the theory group, right? We're, we're, we're doing the predictions, and, and these guys, you know, with their incredible technology, are, are, are seeing the data, are seeing, you know, and, and it's, it's a magic, the, the whole point is you, you've got to get the predictions and then you've got to look in the data for a needle in the haystack, which is this signature of these black holes colliding. Well, and okay. that's, and you think about that, I have a model, I'm looking for the needle in the haystack, that's a different way to describe an in-memory analytic search pattern recognition mm -hmm. problem. That's really what it is. This is the world's largest pattern recognition problem, you know. At, Most at, precise. And I mean, literally, and that's an observation that confirms your theory, right? Is that uh, well, kind of the it way confirms it works? the theory. Maybe it was your theory of well, the theory. I think it was I'm, Einstein's theory. I'm actually theory. a cosmologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in my group, we have relativists who are actively working on these black hole collisions and, and making predictions uh -huh. about this stuff. Right. But they're, so, they're, yeah. they're dampening vibration from passing trucks in these things and correcting uh, yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The technology is amazing. Yeah, but yeah, coming amazing. back to the technology. Yeah. The technology is, one of the reasons why this becomes so exciting and, and becomes practical, is because for the first time the technology has gotten to the point where you can assume that the problem that you're trying to solve can be focused on and you don't have to translate it in technology terms. Right. Yeah, so so yeah. Talk, over to, talk a little bit about, because in many respects, yeah. we're, that's where business is. Business wants to be able to focus on the problem and the, how to think the problem differently and then have the problem and yeah. have the technology just respond. Right. They don't want to have to start with the technology and then imagine what they can do with it. So, so I think from, from our point of view, it's a very fast moving field. Things are changing, new data is coming in. <clears throat> the data is getting bigger and bigger because you know the, the instruments are getting packed tighter and tighter and the, there's more information. So we've got a computational problem as well, so we've got to get more computational power. But you know, there's new types of data, like suddenly there's gravitational waves. There's new types of analysis that we want to do. So we want to be able to look at this data in a very flexible way and, and ingest it and, and explore new ideas more quickly, you know? Uh, because things are happening so fast. And uh, so that, that's why we've, we've adopted th this in-memory paradigm for, for a number of years now. And uh, you know, the latest incarnation of this is the the HP Superdome Flex, uh, and that that 
that's a, a shared memory system. So, so you can just pull in all your data and, and explore it um, w without carefully programming how the memory is distributed around. Okay. So we, we find this is very easy for our users to uh, develop pipelines, data analytic pipelines, to develop their new theoretical models and to compare the two on a single system. Okay, so it's also you know, very easy for new users to use. You, you don't have to be an advanced programmer to get going. You can just stay with the science in a sense. You have yeah. a PhD in physics to do great physics. You don't have to yeah, have a yeah. PhD in physics and technology. That's to right, do yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a very flexible program, uh, a flexible architecture with, with, with which to program. So you, you can more or less take your laptop pipeline, develop your pipeline on a laptop, take it to the Superdome, and then scale it up to these huge memory uh, mm -hmm. problems. And get it done faster, you can iterate. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. And, and, and I mean, these are the most brilliant scientists in the world, bar none, right? I, I made the well, analogy the thanks. other day. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to say, oh, shucks. Yeah. <laughs> shucks. <laughs> yeah. Present company accepted. I made the analogy of, of imagine I am pay or Frank Lloyd Wright or someone had to be their own general contractor, right? Uh, no, yeah. they're brilliant at designing architectures and imagining things that no one else could imagine, and then they had people to go do that. This allows the people to focus on the brilliance of the science without having to go become the expert programmer. We see that in business too, right? Parallel programming techniques are difficult, right? Spoken like an old tandem guy, parallelism is hard. But to the extent that you can free yourself up and focus on the problem and not have to mess around with that, it makes life easier. Some problems parallelize well, but a lot of them don't need to be, and you can allow the data to shine. You can allow the science to shine. Is it correct that the barrier in your ability to reach a conclusion or make a discovery is the ability to find that needle in a, in a haystack? Or maybe there are many, but is... Um, uh, well, if you talking about obstacles to progress, yeah? I, I would say computational power isn't the, the obstacle. It's, it's developing the software pipelines mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's the human personnel, the smart people writing the, the codes that can, can look for the needle in the haystack, yeah. who, who, who have the efficient algorithms to do that. And, and uh, you know, if, if they're cobbled by having to think very hard about the hardware and the architecture they're working with and how they parallelize the problem. Yeah. I, I, our philosophy is much more that you, you, you solve the problem, uh, you validate it. I mean, it can be quite inefficient if you like, but as long as it, it's a working program that, that gets you to where you want, then the second stage, you worry about making it efficient, you know, putting it on accelerators, putting it on GPUs, making it go really fast, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, for, for, for many years now, we've bought these very flexible shared memory, or in-memory is the new word for it, in-memory uh, architectures which, uh, you know, allow you, al allow new users, graduate students, to come straight in without a master's degree in high-performance computing. They can, they can start to tackle problems straight away. Well, it's interesting, we hear the same, you talk about it at the outer reaches of the universe, mm. I hear it at the inner reaches of the universe from the life sciences companies. We want to map the genome and we want to understand the interaction of various drug combinations with that genetic structure to say, can I tune exactly a vaccine or a drug or something else for that patient's genetic makeup to improve medical outcomes? The same kind of problem. I want to have all this data that I have to run against a complex genome sequence to find the one that gets me to the answer. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of the, you know, from, from the macro to the micro, we hear this, hear this problem in all different sorts of languages. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have our clients, mainly in business, mm -hmm. uh, asking us all the time is, with each, uh, well let me step back, in, in as analysts, not the smartest people in the world. Oh, yeah, as I'm you'll sure, attest, I'm, I'm sure, sure, for real. <laughs> um, but Randy as, can attest as, to that. As maybe. analysts, um, you know, we, we like to talk about change, and we always talk about you know, mainframe being replaced by mini computer being replaced by this or that. Yeah. Yeah. I like to talk in terms of the problems that computing's been able to take on. You've been able to take mm -hmm. on increasingly complex, challenging, more difficult, 
problems as mm -hmm. a consequence of the advance of technology. Mm -hmm. Very much like you're saying, the advance of technology allows us to focus increasingly on the problem. Mm -hmm. What kinds of problems do you think physicists are going to be able to attack in the next five years or so as we think about the combination of increasingly powerful computing and an increasingly a simple approach to use it? Yeah, well I, I, I think the simplification you're indicating here is really going to more memory, you know, holding your whole workflow in memory uh, so that you, well, one of the big, biggest bottlenecks we find is ingesting the data and then writing it out, you know. But if you can do everything at once, um, then that's, that's the, uh, the key element. Uh, so, uh, y you know, one of the things we've been working on a great deal is, is in situ visualization, for example, so that, so that you, you see the black holes coming together and you, you, you see that you've set the right parameters. You know, they haven't missed each other or, or something's gone wrong with your simulation. Um, in, in the same way, so, so that you, you do the, the post-processing at the same time. You never need the intermediate data products. So, so larger and larger memory and, and the computational power that, that balances with that large memory. You know, they, it's all very well to get a fat node, yep. but you, you, you don't have the computational power to use all those terabytes. And so that's right. why you, the, 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 the sort of in-memory architecture of Superdome Flex much more balanced between the two. So, so what are the problems that we're looking forward to in, in terms of physics? Well, I mean, in cosmology, we're, we're looking for these hints about the origin of the universe, okay? And we, we've made a lot of progress um, analyzing the Planck satellite data about the cosmic microwave background. We're, we're honing in on theories of inflation, which, are, which is where all the structure in the universe comes from, from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, rapid period of expansion, just like inflation in the financial markets <laughs> in the very early universe. Yes. Okay, and, and so we're, we're trying to identify, can we, can we distinguish between different types and, and are, are they going to tell us whether the universe comes from a higher dimensional theory, 10 dimensions, gets reduced to three plus one or, you know, so, so lots of cl uh, clues like that. We're looking for statistical fingerprints of these different models. In gravitational waves, of course, this whole new area, I mean, we, we think of the, the cosmic microwave background as a photograph of the early universe. Well, in fact, gravitational waves look right back to the, the earliest moment, you know, fractions of a nanosecond um, after the Big Bang. And so it, it may be that the answers, the clues that we're looking for come from gravitational waves. And of course, there's so much in astrophysics that we'll learn about compact objects, about neutron stars, you know, about the most energetic events there are in the whole universe. Yeah, I, I never thought about the idea, because cosmic radiation background goes back, what, about, about 300,000 years after Yeah, that's right, you yeah, were very well informed. 400,000 400, years ago. 400,000, I was going to say 400. 000. Not that well informed, <laughs> huh? No, 370,000. <laughs> but yeah, I, okay. never, I never thought about the idea that's of gravitational good. waves effectively being noise from the Big Bang. And, yeah, and yeah, we yeah, may, yeah. We may well, well. That. With the cosmic microwave background, we're actually okay. looking for a primordial signal from the Big Bang, you know, from inflation. <laughs> so it's, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, what are you going to say, Randy? Well, no, I just, I mean, it, it's amazing the, the, the frontiers we're heading down. It's, it, it's kind of an honor to be able to enable some of these things, right? I've, I've spent 30 years in the technology business, and heard customers tell me you transform my business or you help me save cost or you help me enter a new market. Never before in 30 plus years of being in this business have I had somebody tell me the things that you're providing are helping me understand the origins of the universe. Uh, well, uh, it's just, it's an honor to be a, a well, affiliated the, with you guys. Oh, no, no, the, the honor's mine, Randy, that you're producing the <laughs> hardware, the tools that allow us to do this work. Well, yeah. now the honor's <laughs> ours. Yeah, yeah, coming right. out of the queue. Now, how do we learn more about your work and your discoveries and conclusions? And uh, in terms of looking how at the, does the average Are there popular it, authors that we can read yeah. other than Stephen Hawking? Well, read Stephen's books, they're very okay, good. Okay, but even that one. He's got a new one called The Briefer History of Time. For a Briefer Menace. History yeah, of Time. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a more accessible than The uh, Brief History of Time. So, and so, and it, so your website is, you we, guys? We, yeah, our, our website is ctc.cam.ac.uk, the Center for Theoretical Cosmology, and we've got some popular pages there. 
We've got some news stories about the latest things that have happened, like the HP yep. partnership that we're developing, and some nice videos about uh, the work that we're doing, actually. Very, very nice videos. Yeah, about. and certainly there were several videos run here this yep. week that yep. if people haven't seen them, go yep. out, they're available on YouTube, they're available at yeah, your yeah. website, it, they're on Stephen's yeah, Facebook yeah. page also, yeah. I think. Can you share Beautiful. that website again? Uh, 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 well, uh, actually you can get the the, the, the beautiful vi videos of Stephen and the rest of his group on the Discover website, is that right? Yeah, so. yeah, yep. Okay, yep. so that's yep. a, a HPE Discover website. Yeah, yeah. but your website is? is ctc.cam.ac.uk and we're just about to upload those uh, videos ourselves. CTC. Can I make a marketing suggestion? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simplify this. Yeah. CTC.cam.ac.uk. <laughs> okay, well that's, that's <laughs> a, yeah, right. Thank but you. we got we got to get the cube Very in one scientific. of these yeah, physics fantastic. conferences <laughs> to talk about gravi great. gravitational okay, waves. Yeah, we'll, please. we'll bone up a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're kind of embarrassing yeah. us no, here. No, no, no. hundred thousand years off. He's even better informed than you are. You didn't need to remind me, sir. <laughs> in the brief history of time, that's nothing. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Okay, it's, great. it's been a pleasure, really a pleasure having you. you. Thank you. All right, right keep good. it right there, buddy. <laughs> Mr. Universe and I will be back after this short break. <laughs>